This is Life, Body, Business, Impact with Fatima. Welcome friends, I am so grateful to have you here. I'm your host, Fatima Ingalls, fitness expert, best-selling author, lifestyle entrepreneur, founder of the Life, Body, Business, Fit Systems, and co-founder of the amazing Freedom Retreats. My mission is to positively impact 10 million lives, to inspire you to wake up and live from your bucket list of dreams instead of waking up one day with a bucket list of regrets. Get ready to be inspired with weekly episodes and interviews that disrupt your thinking and motivate you to build your best life, body and business. To change one life is to change many. So come with me now and let's get started with yours. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode. Today, I'm talking with the owner of Living Beauty Fitness, Emilia Ricci. Emilia is a high-achieving, fitness-loving, successful career mum of two. An author of five books, she has been a fitness professional and coach for over 20 years. She's a regular in the pages of Oxygen Magazine Australia as a fitness expert and contributor, and she has competed and coached other women to compete as fitness and bikini models for the last 10 years. She's also a respected judge of bodybuilding events in several federations throughout Australia. Her qualifications include fitness master trainer, yoga and Pilates credentials, and a master's of business majoring in marketing. She worked full time while she built up her business, Living Beauty Fitness, until becoming a mum, where she then took her business on full time. She has created so much success in her health, her fitness, and her business life. This woman has a passion for helping women achieve their fitness goals, sculpt their dream body, and develop a positive mindset to love themselves. She has helped hundreds of women being able to do just that. Amelia, thank you for being here and welcome to the show. So grateful for your time today. Thanks, Fatima. So great to talk to you as always. I'd love for you to tell our listeners a little bit about your own journey and how did you find yourself drawn into the world of fitness? So fitness for me has always been a really big passion and for me I started at the gym when I was at university so I was about 17 or 18 years of age and I was using the gym as a stress relief from my university studies However, what happened was I ended up becoming quite addicted to fitness rather than just using it as a stress relief. And then I wanted to pursue an interest in fitness modeling, which is, I guess, taking fitness to the next level. So I started off as just using it as a stress reliever and then things got a lot more serious with the competition side. So when was it that you first started competing? So it's been 12 years now and um, the first year was 2006 and um, that was when bodybuilding and fitness modelling very much was in its infancy. It wasn't very popular. A lot of people when you said you were doing a competition looked at you blankly and you had to explain exactly what that was. Um, So yeah, 12 years ago now and I did my most recent competition three weeks ago. And so you've been competing for 12 years. What is it about competing? What keeps you keeps drawing you back to competing? What are you getting out of it? I think that competing really gives you that dream with a date and so many different goals that we can set for ourselves might be enticing to begin with. But when you are in the middle of that journey, things come up in life with your children, your family, your work, perhaps stress levels increase. And then you feel like you don't really, um, you're not really enjoying that pursuit of that goal or it's getting tough. But when you're on a competition goal, you have to keep going. You've set yourself that end point and therefore completing the goal is a lot more of, I guess, completing, you know, the whole um, training and the nutrition is going to give you that outcome on stage. So you pretty much have committed yourself to step up there giving it all you've got and it doesn't allow you to back out but then also it gives you that opportunity to be the best that you can be and for me it's always been starting a goal from start to finish and not backing out when the going gets tough. 
They are all great points. And I really love um, the dream with a date. Well, it was certainly the case for me because um, when I first met you, obviously you were my coach, you became my coach and I came to you in relation to competing and I said to you that, you know, I wanted to compete. Well, I didn't I didn't say I wanted to compete. I wanted to uh, try out, but I, I had sort of hidden the fact that I was going to compete until maybe the last week because I was so afraid that I wasn't going to be able to complete what was necessary in terms of the eating and the training to get myself on stage. So having that date um, certainly helped me. And there were so many times, as you would be well aware, competing yourself and coaching so many women to the stage that I didn't want to do it. You know, I, I was tired. I was struggling. I had all these negative thoughts going through my head. But because there was a date that I'd committed to in my mind, I pushed through. And that was part of the beauty and and the learning, I guess, and the transformation to get to stage. Yeah, 100%. And that's what it's all about is it doesn't really matter what type of goal. It could be starting a university degree. It could be start starting a health coaching course. It could be, um, you know, anything in life, a new job. And then once you land this supposed goal that you wanted to get to, you start it and you think, wow, it's actually harder than I thought. But that's what is resilience in life and you know, we have to realise that not every day is going to be amazing. Not every day ticking off those things on our list is going to feel that great. But really to reach the end point, it's about ticking off each of those actions every single day and getting through the days when we're not motivated. And, you know, if anything, that's something that I want to teach my children um, and that I've been always reinforcing to my clients is, you know, when someone starts training with me, I tell them it's not going to be a bed of roses every day. You're going to have your days that go according to plan and then you're going to have your days which are just catastrophic, for want of a better term, <laughs> where you just yeah. think, wow, <laughs> every single thing that could go wrong has gone wrong and I'm not really feeling like doing this. But on those days, you just have to think, all right, we'll just start again tomorrow and just keep on going. Um, and I think that you know, is such an important lesson in life for, for anything that you want to achieve. Yeah, that, that's a really, really good point. You made a couple of points there in relation to um, discipline and the daily disciplines and that it does, a competing journey does mirror so much of what happens in life. There's so many lessons I know that I personally and so many others have taken from that journey and applied it into my everyday life. Has there been any specific lesson that has really rung true for you in relation to your own journey with competing that you have applied into life? Um, I think the feeling of stepping on stage, achieving the goal from start to finish and being your best is probably the greatest moment in um, relation to competitions. Um, and that means that, you have every single day followed your meal plan, every single day you followed your training plan, and then you have, I guess, ticked off everything in other aspects of your life as well. So you haven't just done your meal and your training plan. You've been good at your job. You've been a good, perhaps, partner, parent, you know, and you haven't dropped the ball in other areas of your life either. And I would say that's really the greatest moment is getting to the day because you haven't dropped the ball in other areas of your life rather than people might think in their mind, oh, the greatest moment will be winning a trophy or the greatest moment will be, I don't know, everyone clapping when you're up there or, you know, anything else. Um, you know, I think it really is the joy is in the journey that you have actually followed through and been a good person along the journey as well. 100% agree with that. That was certainly my own personal, um, my own personal experience as well. I thought it was going to be about stepping on stage that moment where you know where I really wanted to win a trophy, but it was about everything that I overcame and kept pushing through and juggling and managing to get myself to be able to actually get on stage. So, with daily disciplines, you mentioned them before. The women that you're coaching, you're not just coaching for competitions. You work with so many women and mums to just transform their life. Yes. What What are your strategies? What are your pointers for them to to be able to stick to it when they are having those catastrophic days and, and when there is so much to do in terms of your training and eating and, and life and kids? What are some daily disciplines that that you give them 
and some strategies to help them through that. Well, if we start with nutrition, nutrition is an investment in yourself. So having a regular grocery shopping day or if you um, can get your groceries delivered, um, I recently started getting my groceries delivered after my second child was born because I found it was impossible to go to the grocery store with two young children. And I always thought, oh, it's too expensive. I'm not going to do it and I won't be able to choose my own fresh produce. But I found a local uh, supermarket that actually has amazing quality fresh produce, which overcame my barrier to that. And therefore, I've started getting a weekly grocery delivery, which saves me so much time. And I don't have to spend that hour or when you're with two children, maybe two hours picking out everything. And then it gets delivered to me. And then it's a matter of just meal prepping uh, meals in bulk. And that might be some meal preps for the baby. It could be like pureed food for the baby. It could be a whole tray of protein like chicken or fish for myself. It could be some, you know, chopping up some things for the toddler's lunch boxes. So definitely say the daily discipline of meal prep and whether you do that every second day or twice a week or however you want to manage that, um, that is super important. Um, and it's just down to even small things like, you know, we fill up our kids' water bottle, like say my son is four, but you've got to do that for yourself as well. So you know, at the end of the day, it's all well and good to go, oh, okay, yep, my toddler's got two vegetables that, you know, he's got maybe like some cucumber and some tomatoes and he's got some fruit and then he's got his carbs and then he's got, you know, maybe some cheese for the protein. But you've got to think about your own nutrition like that as well. And it's just as easy to chop up a whole heap of different stuff and give that to yourself as well as your kids. And that would be the number one thing is definitely nutrition because there's such a strong link between nutrition and um, our mental health. So you'll quite often find that if we don't eat well, um, we feel our moods really degenerate. We don't believe in ourselves. We start to feel awful from the inside out because your body does need those micronutrients that are in the fresh foods. Um And that's really where it all starts. And then I guess with your daily discipline, with your training, you don't have to exercise every day, but you should move every day. And by moving, what I'd mean by that is if you're going out walking with the pram or you're going to the park with your kids or use, you know, if they're playing sport out on an oval, you could, you know, watch them play sport, but then go for a walk around the oval. Like there's so many things that you can do just to get your daily exercise activity without going, okay, I have to go to the gym. And then maybe the gym or your Pilates class or, you know, whatever you enjoy doing is like three times a week you could do that for an hour. But then the rest of the day, the days that you can't commit to a structured training routine, I would strongly recommend getting creative and thinking, well, okay, what can I do? Um, you know, one example is, um, I know with you, with your comp prep, Fatima, when you couldn't go walking outside, you walked up and down your hallway. <laughs> I did. Um, it was pouring with rain and I had, you know, really little ones and so I, I didn't have anyone to stay with the kids. I didn't have a treadmill and I couldn't just, you know, go off to the gym at 4 o'clock in the morning. So you're right, I it poured down with rain and I was walking up and down the hallway. Lucky I had a really long hallway. <laughs> Yeah, and so it's just about getting creative with things like that. I mean, I was staying in an apartment on the weekend. I went on a vacation um, to a beachside location and I couldn't really get my exercise in. So one of the days I just ran up and down the stairs in the apartment. I think another day um, I went for a few, like, walks with the pram and then another day I just went out on the balcony and just did some push-ups and some tricep dips. Obviously those things are not a complete workout, but that's going to give you that, movement that the body needs and also if you are eating extra foods and you're not burning those calories that's obviously going to result in a dramatic weight gain if you're on vacation um so it's always good no matter you know where you're at and what you're doing to think of fitness as a long-term proposition rather than okay I'm doing an eight or a 12 week program and that's all I'm going to do and I have to be really really committed like it's the small things, I guess what I'm saying is like your non-exercise activity is going to add up to like heaps and heaps more calorie burn and it's a lot more achievable for busy entrepreneurs or busy parents or busy people rather than thinking, oh, I have to get up from my desk and go to the gym. Then I have to factor in that driving time there and back. You know, there's so many things you can do from home, you know, in between clients or you could do after a school pickup or, 
you know, really at any time of the day, that might just be a 10 or 15 minute thing that's going to add up when you add up those minutes over the week. Does that make sense? Absolutely makes sense. And it's about doing things, I guess, for the same amount of time or, or no extra time. Like you said, you know, if you if your kids are at sport, so I've got three sons and we've got sports seven days a week between their training and their games. So my training at the gym has certainly dropped back. So I've had to do exactly what you said, find ways to fit movement into my day. So yeah, I'll watch him training and I'll go walking and and walking, lun- you know, doing walking lunges while listening to a podcast. It's about um, being able to fit it in to your lifestyle. Obviously, if I was competing and competing was a goal right now and that's what someone's doing, or they've got a very specific um, goal with a specific date, then you take attention and time away from other things in your life to really yeah. focus on on this because it's a commitment and it's important. But right now, for my life and for many others, I guess, maybe their their business or or their children or their partner is a big focus. So you have to make it work around and within that lifestyle. And like you said, it's fitness for life. It's not That's just it. eight or 10 or 12 weeks to get to the end of a challenge. You've got to be looking at implementing it as a long-term lifestyle. And I think that's where you won't have to ever have damage control. So the reason why people need that big damage control, like, oh, I've put on 10 kilos or I haven't done any exercise for six months, is because they have that mindset of if I'm not at the gym or I'm not following a structured workout program, it's it's not any point in doing it. I'll just pick up when I can do the full program. And that may be a mindset of people that are entrepreneurs or business people. It's, it's all about perfection or nothing. But really with your body, Um, you know, if you think about the evolution of humans and where we've come from, no one really followed a structured training program. It was all about that, you know, (laughs) I guess that hunter-gatherer, you know, like picking food from the wild or, you know, like chasing or chasing or being chased by wild animals, you know. It wasn't that that style of exercise that we've evolved from. So, yeah, we need to get out of that mindset of it has to be following a plan or a a PT workout or something like that, or it's worthless. I think, you know, if more people just thought along those lines of, you know, like do a few push-ups and triceps while the kettle's boiling or, like you said, the lunges whilst listening to a podcast, then people wouldn't have that problem of getting overweight because they are keeping on moving. Yeah, really, really great points. And, um, yeah, we used to have to chase chase down the tigers and chase our meal down for the night. There's a lot more activity and now we sit down so much more and there's so much more convenience. So um, something that I had some of my corporate clients do and some of my personal clients was just push-ups in between, you know, having a goal of getting 100 push-ups in for the day or yeah. squats. And that was just in lots of 10 or 20 setting time as reminders to take a break from the desk and just drop down on the floor and quickly quickly do it. And it was really great because um, it spread through the office and through this particular workshop and they'd see other people doing going, hey, what are you doing? And it was actually encouraging others to to incorporate a little bit more movement into their day, which was wonderful because, as you know, there's a ripple effect. Once you start moving, you start eating better or the other way around. You start giving your body better nutrition, then you start making, feeling like moving more and making better choices around your exercise and and health and fitness so it all rolls into one doesn't it yeah definitely with your um the women that you work with you see you you work with lots of busy women you're a very busy woman yourself juggling so many things what are some common challenges that you see that they face in relation to their health and fitness yeah, I think it's time. I think it is um, a lack of self-belief and um, definitely that negative mindset of, um, yeah, they just sort of maybe eat something that they feel is a bad food and then they're off track after that or they skip, you know, a few workouts and they don't feel like they can get on track again. So th- those are probably the biggest challenges Um Yeah, like the emotional eating is probably a big one um, that, you know, I think a lot of us suffer that when, I don't know, you've had a bad day and things go wrong and then instead of um, just thinking, oh, that's just a bad day, they sort of tend to try and um, 
calm your emotions with either alcohol or food or um, just going, oh, I just can't be bothered doing my workout when really those three things are like not drinking, you know, having a nutritious meal and maybe doing a small workout would make us feel 100% better. But it just is pretty hard when, yeah, you feel that pressure and that stress. So I would say stress, a lack of time, and then that lack of self-belief when people just feel like, you know, life's getting all too hard, but they don't realise that life wasn't really meant to be easy. Like, you know, I always say, like, life is 50% pleasure, 50% pain. And, um, yeah, people are always expecting um, life to be 100% pleasure, but that's not how it works. No, definitely not, and it's it's not problem-free. People talk about, you know, I've got this problem, that problem. Problems are a part of life. You just yeah. – you know, you just want to work on having a better quality of problem rather than, you know, <laughs> the low low quality or low energy problems. So time, lack of self-belief, stress and emotional eating were the things that you mentioned. And I'm sure that there are so many people listening to this who can absolutely relate. I know that I can. So when you come across those challenges or do you still come across those challenges yourself? Yeah, definitely. I think you sort of have your periods in life where everything's going really well. And I know last year I um, did a competition and I did like so well for 20 weeks. I had this dream run. I don't even know how I had a dream run because I had a newborn at the time and a toddler and a business. But I just had this dream run for 20 weeks where I was like smashing my training and going really well with my nutrition plan and everything was just so on point and every week I just like ticked off the week like absolutely killing it and then I think the reason what happens is changes come up again so it might be a change in business or it might be a change in your family so for me it was a change in my family so having a baby grow into an older baby that obviously you want to focus on her development and spend more time playing and then a toddler going from just like I guess more of that baby phase into being a little boy and then again you want to spend more time with them and playing and talking and mentoring um, and then of course their schedules may change with you know like now I've got my son at kindy it's the pickups and the drop-offs which are the same as anyone who's got kids at school so for me it was changes in my family and then everything just started to fall apart with my eating and my training and I wasn't being able to really train at consistent times and I wasn't Um, eating enough during the day so then I would get home and just be like eating way too much food at night and just you know for example when you're cooking dinner and then you're just picking on all this junk food and thinking why am I doing this this is ridiculous I know better than this so it happens to the best of us it's just a matter of noticing that habit not really judging yourself and then getting back on track um, you know and getting a coach for accountability and making sure that you know, if you are doing a weekly check-in or a fortnightly check-in with your coach, that then, you know, it's a positive coaching process and you're just setting new goals for the week. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And it's really great, I guess, for people to hear that it does happen to people who are in the industry like yourself for 20 years, you know what to do, but you still have those moments where there are struggles and you are human, like the rest of us. And it's, It's nice to hear because I know people say to me all the time when I've shared my own challenges, oh, we thought you didn't, you know, we thought you didn't have to deal with that because you are in the industry. Um, So I guess it just humanises the issues that people do have to face every single day. So have you ever faced burnout, Amelia, or come close to it? Because it's such, such a huge thing that happens to so many high achieving people these days. They work themselves so hard and juggle so much that they end up getting to the point if they don't look after their physical, mental and emotional health, that they just, they stop. They can't go any further. Yes, that was around 2009, I believe. Um, And I had just uh, gone to like a national competition and, um, I had done really, really well in my competition, but I'd also pushed myself very, very hard, like physically in that competition. And um, at that stage as well, I was working full time and I had my business on top of that and I was organising my wedding. And, yeah, I just basically started to um, feel really, really exhausted and tired. And then 
after sort of cut a long story short, I visited like a few different medical practitioners and then I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue. Um, but the thing that I think back then as well was that there wasn't really a lot of awareness of, um, I guess, back then, let's say even 2009, so like 10 years ago, it was more like if you were burnt out or you had fatigue, not many people knew about it or if they did, they weren't really having it as something normal. So therefore, there wasn't really good treatment paths. So it took me like a couple of years really to get back on track properly and what I had to do was cut back my um, full-time work to three days a week and then I pretty much, um, yeah, stopped uh, the intensity of the training that I was doing at the gym. Um, But, yeah, I just feel like if we knew what medical practitioners know today about, um, you know, like say counselling and hypnotherapy and different nutrition that you could try, I probably would have got on top of it a lot um, better. But I guess it's like anything, you know, 10 years ago, things were different and there wasn't uh, many pathways for people. If you did have chronic fatigue or you did feel um, exhausted, it was more seen as like, oh, you're a failure or you're someone who's quite different. Whereas now there's so many, um, so much awareness for all types of illnesses that are not necessarily um, medically proven um and I think yeah that's the difference now is that if someone says I've got a gut issue or I'm not feeling well or um you know this doesn't make me feel good mentally there's a lot more pathways for people and yeah back then 10 years ago it was um yeah something that I just tended to have to deal with myself and just try and get through it so that was how I got through it just by cutting back my workload and slowly exploring different paths with nutrition and yeah so what would you say now that you have actually been through this, what are a couple of tips that you would give women or anyone to avoid hitting burnout? Um, so my number one tip is don't believe that you are invincible. Um, and, you know, it's so important. I think these days people will want to set themselves these massive goals like, I don't know, you hear all the time, you know, let's build your business to six figures and let's, um, you know, make sure that you're achieving on all these different levels. And, you know, whilst that sounds very enticing, I always say, well, no one's going to pay your medical bills if you push yourself that hard. You have to, you know, sort that out. And unless you can scale your business to a point where you can employ other people or if you are working for someone else, be assertive enough to take charge of the hours that you're working, then it's just really headed for a path of self-destruction. So it's that thing of if you work for someone else, always saying yes to the extra hours. Um, If you work for yourself, it's about over-pushing yourself and thinking I must succeed, I must succeed at all costs, where I feel as a health and wellness practitioner myself that Success is not just defined by how much money you earn. Success is not just defined by how much many clients you have. Or, um, it's a hundred percent agree by, with that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely really not just by. about money. No, and you want to as well just do a good job with the people that you work with. And so, a lot of people you will find them wearing it as a badge of honor, like you know, oh, I've got a hundred clients, or I'm making this amount of money, or I'm working, you know, 70 hours a week and isn't this fantastic? I'm so busy. But you'll find that those are the people that don't really last very long. Um, And I think as you progress through life, you do become a lot wiser and you just realise, oh, I thought that was what I wanted. I thought that's what success was. But no, that's actually not what I want. Um, I actually want to have balance. I actually enjoy time with my family. I enjoy time to relax every day. And, you know, like say, for example, women tend to just work to like, you know, eight o'clock at night, then the kids are in bed, then they're doing washing, then they're doing maybe prep for the next day, then they're checking their emails. And it's not enough to like just go, all right, I finished all my stuff at 11 o'clock at night. And now I'm just going to go to bed and wake up the next day. Your body actually needs time to relax. It's not normal like to to you know like work to 11 o'clock at night and wake up at five o'clock in the morning and start the day again and I think that's what people the reason why people are getting sicker and getting stressed and because they're just taking on more and more and more and they're not implementing um 
that relaxation time. And that's probably the number one thing that I would say is to make sure that you're not pushing yourself too hard and that you do have relaxation time every day. And that may mean not achieving your goals at the pace that you wish to achieve them. Yeah, that's a really good point again. And relaxation, I think women in particular struggle to give themselves downtime. It's like they they seem to have some guilt or there's always something to do, right? So why am I sitting down, putting my feet up and just enjoying a movie? Like I shouldn't be doing that. I should be up. There's dishes to wash or there's, you know, there's um, client plans to do. There's always something to be doing. So it's it's yeah. that mindset, isn't it, of, you know, it is okay and it is just as important to sit down and, and relax and do or go out for a walk or spend time with friends as it is to do everything else that you're doing. I mean, the washing's always going to be there, right? <laughs> if, it's, if it's not done today, <laughs> you've got tomorrow. That's right. Yeah, definitely. I'd love, love to shift gears a little bit and talk about social media and body image. You've got quite a large following on social media and and I know you've been in in the media in various forms for some time you're in oxygen magazine Australia quite regularly do you feel pressure to look a certain way in the fitness industry particularly these days with all the social media and all the images that are flooding our feeds daily Uh, I think there is a certain pressure, um, but with my Instagrams, I've got two. I've got Living Beauty Amelia and then I've got Living Beauty Fitness. And one of my posts that went viral last year on Living Beauty Amelia on Instagram was a Instagram versus reality post where I was sitting down in a really slouch position showing all my mummy tummy with the little rolls of skin in a crop top. And then in the next post, um, I sort of like, I guess, collage the two pictures together, standing tall in what you would consider would be an Instagram post. And that post um, actually went viral. And I just truly believe that people want to see the real you. And that's what I actually love about social media is that nowadays more and more people are sharing the stuff like the stretch skin from having kids or the stretch marks or, you know, the post baby body like in reality. And so whilst Um, there may be some people that just continue to post all the perfect stuff. I tend to post my Instagram versus reality photos that, yeah, get a lot of engagement. And I just also uh, on my Instagram stories always try to talk about the problems in life and not just the highlight reel. And so, no, I don't really think me personally where I'm at now, like I don't really feel that pressure, not at all. And that's a wonderful place to be. And um, I'll put your links to your Instagram in the show notes, but you do absolutely share not just the highlight reel. I see it all the time in your stories and in your posts. You share the reality of life, which I think is so, so important. And it goes a long way in in helping everyone to realise that those images that are up there and they're filtered and they're all perfect they are not reality. You do have your ups and your downs and and challenges like every other person out there. So thank you for sharing that. (laughs) Really, really appreciate that. Do you have any final messages for the audience or action items? Um, I think, you know, if um, people are listening to the podcast and they're sort of questioning, I guess, their own direction with, um, you know, whether it's their finding they're a little bit off track with their health and fitness or they're just finding that they are not feeling happy in their everyday life. I think it's so important just to sit down and have a complete audit of your life and, you know, just get a blank piece of paper and just sit there and think to yourself, what is making me unhappy? And then write down what actually makes you happy and make sure that you do something that makes you happy every single day. And It might just be something as sitting down with a coffee in your back garden and no screens, no distractions or a cup of tea or whatever you enjoy, a beautiful glass of water with lemon in it or whatever, and just thinking, you know what, I can actually sit here for five minutes without checking my phone, without on my email, without reading something and give yourself that mental space. Um, You know, something else that you may enjoy doing is, you know, just catching up with a friend face to face and actually talking because so much of our life now is spent on the internet 
you know, typing or, you know, looking at our phone and smiling at our phone. I mean, I walk past people in the street and they're smiling at their phone and I think this is such a, <laughs> a bizarre world that we live in. Um, you know, people are smiling at their phone. It's like a, it would be like unheard of like 10 years ago. Um, and, yeah, I guess my main message is if you're feeling unhappy with any aspect of your life, take action and just sit down and think, what is making me unhappy? How can I change that? And what are the things that feel really, really good? And how can I do some small things for five minutes a day just to make myself feel better? And then you'll find that if you just slowly work with those two ends of the spectrum, the things that are making you happy and the things that are making you unhappy and gradually increase the things that make you happy, decrease the things that make you unhappy, then you'll be on that path to yeah, mental health, to physical health, and to feeling really positive about any other goal that you want to achieve in your life. Yeah, that's some great tips and really achievable in bite-sized pieces. So it's it's not completely overwhelming thinking that you have to change everything, you know, all in one go to, to make an impact in your life. So I love those tips. Thank you so much, Amelia, for taking the time to share your expertise with us. Thank you for having me, Fashima. Hey guys, Amelia has given us such a lovely gift. There is a code in the show notes to get 20% off any of her five books. She's got the eight week bikini body shape up, flat abs secrets, fit pregnancy and beyond, four week bikini body advanced and the vegan detox and yoga program. So for all you listeners, 20% off, the code will be in the show notes. So make sure you jump onto that. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I truly hope you have found it beneficial and have taken some value from it. Hopefully, a lot. If you did, please, please share this show with anyone you feel may need to hear it. I would also absolutely love if you would take a minute or two to review this show on iTunes, Stitcher, or whichever platform you happen to be listening to it on. With your help, we can accomplish my mission to positively impact 10 million lives. That would be so awesome. Now, if you want to connect with me or my guests on other platforms, or if you want to send me an email with questions or ideas of guests to interview, please check out the show notes. I am so incredibly grateful to have had your time today, and I can't wait to have you on the next episode. Have a great day.